Do you owe anything to Tiger Woods? And by that, I'm referring to you, Tiger, Doral, Golf Channel. 100%. 100%. I've, I've said this and it's, I mean it. Like what you're talking about is after he won in 97, I drove down to Doral to, to, to ask him if he would do an interview with me. And I, I knew him well enough. It's a different time. I wouldn't like you text the dude. So I got in my car and drove from Orlando to Miami. Um, and sat and waited in the locker room and asked him if we could do this thing the week of Bay Hill. He's like, I got, I, I told this story. Like literally he's like, wait, what are you doing here? I was like, I came here to ask you if you do this thing. He's like, right. Okay. No, really. Why are you here? I said to ask you if you would do this interview. And then he did it. Hey, Scott, you, you joined us right on time. Uh, we're, we're placing our bets uh, for the national championship tonight. Are we overthinking it? Am I overthinking it if I'm thinking about Purdue? If you, if, if you want to take the points against this, against this wood chipper, yeah. then have at it. And I'm Mr. Take the Points. Yeah. But at this, at this stage, I don't know how many games in a row UConn has to win by double digits before you just say, I'm just going to lay them. It's been free money for two straight years and my dumb ass is like give me bama give me that can give me that candy <laughs> feeling yeah. pretty smart until it's like oh and they, they hit another three. Oh, they're gonna win by 18 oh yeah well what do you know well it's like today i catch myself being like well isn't vegas smart enough to know that everybody's on yukon why wouldn't they why wouldn't they hang like nine and a half or ten i you know you catch yourself overthinking a little bit that is the that is the conversation here at augusta today it was a lot okay. of what are we doing with this number? Like, shouldn't it be? And I, 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 yeah, I mean, at some point you'd think they'd get sick of having their teeth kicked in by Bay, uh, by UConn, but I don't know, man. I mean, look, Purdue, they're a one. They're good. They got a big guy. Hey, give this out at the in the chow line tonight. Uh, Donovan Klingon, first basket layup. First basket of the game, Donovan Klingon, layup. They're going to go right at Edie. Plus 1,400. What if it's a dunk? Then I'm shit out of luck. But, you know, it has to be a layup. Yeah, it's got to be a layup. It's got to be like a post move or a layup. Yeah. How do you define a layup? That's what I'm wondering. I guess I'll find out around, you know, 835 p.m. tonight. A floater is not a layup. Hey, Scott, let's get this started for real. Are you um, are you tired of hearing about the eclipse already? Uh, No, they gave us these cool glasses down here at Augusta and I I was checking it out. I. My bride sent me pictures of the kiddos. They were checking it out. I mean, I just was thinking about this. No joke. Like, remember that? What was that movie? Uh, Apocalypto. Apocalypto. Right? Mm-hmm. That was it's a great dark. movie. It's yeah. a great movie. Yeah, yeah. It was it's dark. pretty dark. Hey, the guy, the the guy's cardio. The main bad guy in that movie had the most elite cardio in any movie of all time. He ran for three days. Dazed, uh, <laughs> plural. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I start for some reason. I'm not kidding. I and I wasn't on edibles. Maybe you were. I'm looking <laughs> hey, at it. No, 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 I'm no. looking at it, and I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm just glad we don't live in a time where I looked up and one like thought that the gods were angry and like we freak out <laughs> and just go running into traffic. There wouldn't have been traffic at that time. But you know what I'm saying? Like yes, at least we can dude. we can make sense of it now. No, I, none of this troubles me. I, I was not perpetually online today. I was here at the Masters. I was decidedly not really consuming a lot of that, so I didn't have enough exposure to get sick of it. Probably. What do you think Ryan Rosillo's take is on the on the on the eclipse? Whatever's <laughs> whatever's anti the gen- whatever's general the, populace. Look, I know the eclipse is doing record numbers. It's hard to argue with that. So but. is SGA. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, tell I the, love tell that. This, I love tell it. This, tell this story as you remember it in Vegas when it comes to my. Blackjack uh, prowess. Okay. Speaking of Ryan and the gang. <laughs> so it goes like goes a little something like this. We're, we're in a room. Apparently the room was inhabited not long prior, or before I should say, uh, by Jay-Z. Yeah. Apparently, same apparently, it was, apparently it was a Jay-Z private room. They just, decidedly just down, they, they downgraded as it was <laughs> uh, the three of us. And Stanford Steve was there for moral support. And we're playing cards. 
Um, and they're dealing uh, blackjack. Everyone understands the rules. And mm. Chris is on what they would call first base. He's the first first man to act. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris was dealt an ace and a, and a five. Is that right? That's 15. That's, it's, it's a six. six yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> Math's hard sometimes. Ace, five. We... We have oh ace is a one okay yeah that was we like have a soft 11. Okay, we have eleven yeah and got it we have a soft six is what soft that would six. be described as and a lot of those are out here <laughs> hey now uh, Chris says I'm good and well <laughs> we're like whoa 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 and again we're not it's not like a crowded room there's not somebody I'm trying next my best to, too I'm not being funny I'm trying I'm. And it, it was a very, you guys know that uber earnest Chris face? Like, I'm good. <laughs> and Is that a face and, and I'm, I'm with third base for Silla's in the middle. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, what are you afraid you're going to get the 16 card? Like, <laughs> I don't know. You got to hit. I, no, 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 no. You, you want to hit. And then he says the greatest line of all time. I'm safe. <laughs> We've all got probably maybe some more than others, but I, I got a million Vegas stories of people that were in various states of sobriety and otherwise playing cards that made decisions that were good and bad. But no one has ever had a soft six against dealer whatever and said, I'm safe. And we encouraged him to take a hit. I don't know what happened. I know that whatever my stack was, I it, it was evaporated rather quickly. It was not a great sesh on the yeah, tables. We, we but the highlight the club too. The, the highlight of the session was was Chris Long standing on Ace Five because uh, he was safe. That's how I left the table. We went to the PFT commenter rolled up and we went to a nightclub and we were like, yeah, Scott, this is goodbye, I guess. You know, like, uh, but the way I got th that money that I gambled away there was Baker Mayfield gave me chips six hours earlier and I hit on 17. The whole fucking table, they were like, <gasps> it was like in a Western when the wrong person walks through the door. And I was like, what did I do? Uh, and I fucking nailed it, dude. And Ooh. the whole place is going crazy. And but so wait, I, didn't the deal, typically the dealer will do you a solid in that position and not hit just, they just say, it wasn't Whoa. my money. I didn't give a fuck. I was like, Hey babe, I'm, I'm hitting bro. You know, like he, he was like, Hey, it's your money now. I was like, thanks dad. What's the mentality on that? Like, I, I feel like a three or a four is coming. No, it's just like I, I can't wait to be out, off this table. No, oh, no right. offense to, no offense to people that play cards. Like, I want to be in the sports book. Like, I just, you know, I'm down here to see my friends. I was there to hang out with Scott. Like, I don't give a fuck what happens to this. The mentality was, I don't know the rules, and I, I can't don't know do the rules. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But just for Ace Five Safe is the is the is the code. <laughs> Is the code, the catchphrase moving forward. But we did we did catch up, Chris, later that night, uh, after you guys went to the club. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that that's cat. uh no, I understand there's there's things, you know, like there's the old saying is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, which is total bullshit. Because if something great happens, you tell everybody you, you gotta know. Tell everybody. But I would just say that we'll we'll leave this for, for you, me and Marcillo. Listen, I'll, I'll just say this: like working backwards, it's the hardest I laughed in 2024. <laughs> And Scott, it was one of those fits of laughter where I'm looking at Scott. Scott's looking at me. We can't stop laughing. We're at a bar in the lobby at no. the win. And there was a certain individual who was just, he made us gleeful walking through this place. And that's Joyous. all we'll say. Joyous. Joyous. Like, is, 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 Scott, is the Super Bowl the one place, dude, that I feel like, because I've known you a long time and mm -hmm. I've gotten to see you kind of like, you know, I'm looking up, but I'm watching you kind of ascend and events. I can remember back in the day, you used to really be able to go out in Bourbon Street and stuff and, oh, yeah. you know, have a good time. The Super Bowl seems like it's the one thing that's big enough, you know, and kind of wacky enough that you could actually get out and enjoy yourself. Especially well, Vegas, Vegas. Is, Vegas is built yeah. for it because nobody cares. And, and you know, the, it's a, the Super Bowl is this funnel that just yeah. takes everybody what, wherever your station is in life and kind of puts you all together. We all just happen to be in the win encore, sort of that, that gap in the middle Whatever yeah. that bar's called, I don't even know. But yeah. I mean, that's 
We do go way back. That's where we first met 100 years ago. And it, it's, I think it was like a Madden party way back in the day before the draft. It was a Madden party at the Super Bowl. I think it was in Tampa, maybe. Yeah, it, whatever. It's, it was you know, a long you know, time you, ago. You know what night it was? I was at the bar <laughs> drinking beer with uh, Fred Robbins, Justin Tuck, and the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, Antonio Pierce. There you go. The and you and you were there with Ryan and um, and Steve. And, Dude, thank and, you for letting us borrow Steve on such a regular basis, man. He's we, the best. Said, he's the best. He is the best. He was there as well. You're right. What you said about the laughter, though, honestly, it's you forget how good it feels to laugh to the point that you think you may pass out. And we both yeah. did. Yeah, we both that, did. Yeah, were we you were you laughing at a famous person or a civilian? Totally regular cat, dude. Okay. Regular dude. I'll tell you when we get offline. Okay. Um, can you be that's, a that's, fan? That's, that's a shitty thing to do to the listeners because you're like, well, what happened? It, if you see just, me at a bar, ask me about the guy. There you go. Okay, that's going to be an inside <laughs> joke on the show. Um, Scott, can you be a fan at the Masters? I feel like you work your whole life to get like this awesome access and vantage point, and now like just knowing you, I can imagine looking out you know, at the mm -hmm. infield or whatever you call it and saying, I wish I had a beer in my hand sometimes. Uh, you don't have to really. Cause I think there's a, there's just, there's this appreciation just at, for being here. Yeah. That, the, the whole vibe of this week is just, everyone's grateful to be here. Right. And, and, and so, I, I mean, I'm a fan of the place. I'm a fan of what it feels like to be here. And so yeah. I don't need to be, you know, at a spot on 16 or a spot anywhere on the grounds. Cause where I'm, I'm sitting in the Butler cabin and we, it's on the T it's on the screen in front of me. And you're right. You got to remind yourself sometimes because it's this weird thing. I'm, I'm more like a greeter. Uh, we come on the air and you're in the Butler cabin, you welcome everybody. And then it's a CBS broadcast. So when we do the PGA championship, we're the ones calling it, but this is mostly not us. So there are times I not even kidding where I'm just sitting there and I'm watching Jim Nance call golf. And then all of a sudden they'll be like, let's go down to the Butler cabin. You're like, Oh wait, I'm supposed to, I'm doing this. And it's surreal. I mean, I, we have known each other a long time and I'm grateful for what I do. I still enjoy the hell out of it. Thank God. It's, it's fun. It's sports, but this is the one week and the one event that you, no matter how long I do it, it's impossible to believe I get to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no question. And and I'm sincere. Like you can't be, like you walk into the Butler cabin and you sit there and you you're every every year at like 258. My dad passed away when I was in college. My dad and I used to watch the Masters. Like the last minute before I come on, I just think of my dad. And there's a line of like when you lose your dad young, you spend the rest of your life trying to make him proud. And I sit there and I think my pop would, would be pretty fired up that this is what I do. And then they like count you down and then you're the person that says hello and you're the masters is on television. It's just impossible to believe that, that that's what you get to do. What's your favorite little thing about the masters that you'd have to attend the masters to know? Mm, that's a great question. The little thing is not a little thing at all. It's a big thing. And it's, it's the Oak tree behind the, the clubhouse. And it's where everybody just sort of meets. Like if, I have a friend, a hunt, like many years ago, I told him I'd meet him at the Oak Tree, totally forgot. Nobody has any cell phones, blew him off unintentionally. <laughs> and so to this day, he just we, he just calls me Oak Tree because mm -hmm. he's still waiting. But the that's the place on the property where and it's a little it, it's it, to me, if you're inside, if you're if you're on the property, it's you're on the right side of the lot of the ropes, so to speak. But there, this is yeah. a place that not everyone can be. And luckily we had the, the badge to be there and you just see, you see people every year and I'm talking like there's billionaires and actors and whatever. And then there's just regular people that happen to be there and everyone has the same feeling of appreciation, no matter who they are, which is actually kind of the coolest thing about it. Like everyone in, that's here knows this is where you want to be. And so that place standing there and they're off to the left, there are all these tables with these green and white umbrellas. And it's like you can eat the – like today it was 80 degrees. There's no, no humidity. The sun's out. And if you sat on that uh, – on one of those tables today and ate a cheeseburger and drank an azalea, you were on the best spot on earth. And it's not has nothing to do with the actual golf itself, but it has everything to do with what it feels like to be at the Masters. 
Are you nervous at all to call, what are you calling the 18th this, this year? Like, is this your first time doing it or what are you doing? No, I, I, I no, I mean, it doesn't make me nervous. That's the strangest thing. I feel, I feel yeah. the oddest sense of calm. Uh, and I don't know why that is. Um, I really don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, did, were you nervous when you played games? No, I was nervous leading up. The exactly. Week. The week 258, when I'm thinking about my dad, I feel that like butterflies, but then you do what you do. And I, no, it, it, you don't feel nervous. Um, I would say this though, like I, I, I was talking to Jeff Darlington, who's, who's with us this week about yeah. what it, like, if you go to a black tie party, you dress a certain way and you probably act a certain way. Not the same as if it's a, if it's a cookout and you're going to wear flops and you know, have your hat on backwards, you're probably just a different version of yourself. And I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I act different. But I'm certainly not the same as me and Steve doing bad beats. You know, mm -hmm, yeah. it's a, it's a, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. still you, but mm -hmm. you just are sort of the most cleaned up version of yourself. And so I'm always, I'm always conscious of wanting to do the job as well as it needs to be done. And like, I feel like our show belongs to us. So I'm not as uh, worried if I make a mess. That makes sense. Like, yeah, it's yeah, our yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, your name's on it. It's fine. Like, and if I do, so what? I'll clean it up. But it feels Here, like somebody else's house. Exactly, and and it's the and it's the nice it's the nicest room in the nicest house. And you're you're a very welcome guest. You just don't want to be the asshole that knocks the china on the ground. So there's that that I don't feel nervous. I just want to do I want to do the job correctly. Got any single stalls in that uh, butler cabin? What's the bathroom set up? It's it's a it's an actual cabin. So the bathroom is a is like a proper, like perfect subway tile and all the whole bit. And uh, yeah, I mean it's not like stalls at the at the bus station. It's it's the it's a proper like gold toilet. Put 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 better. It's a solo setup. You can lock the door and be by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Good. There's a lot Very of pressure good. that goes into going into the bathroom and the butler's cabin. It's, it's implied you only do one thing in there. Right. So I just I don't know where you're going with that, but I don't want to go there. How about Tiger Woods, man? Do you think he's ever going to chill the fuck out like, and, and be able to just sit still? I mean, think about Tiger Woods at 60. Like, What do you think Tiger Woods at 60 is doing? He seems like a guy who cannot stop competing on some level. I think his body will tell him when he can't, you know, yeah. probably, probably you and, and a lot of your colleagues can relate to what that is. Like did the, you know, I think we might've even had conversations about, about whether your brain and your, and your body are, are at odds with one another, right. About yeah. whether you want to still do it. And at some point with a fused back and all he went through with the, the accident um, and his leg being compromised and all the surgeries, like at some point you just can't, especially this place. This is a big ballpark and the hills are many. Uh, so it's the type of place where at some point that day will arrive and it'll suck for everybody when it does, because he was just the, he was the guy that was the, the tide that lifted every boat in the sport, including mine. You know I mean? I, my, I don't have the career I have if he didn't come along when he did. Um, but I think the, the, I think the cool thing is that he's still stubborn stubborn enough to want to compete and yeah. to, to want to, you know, to want to feel that feeling. Like I, I say, I'll say this, like for years he chased Jack and Nicholas won 18 majors. And that's, that was, that's what he had to do. There was no negotiating with himself. Like that's what he had to do. And then you reach a point where your body says, all right, that may not happen. You're going to need to be good with that. But when he won the last one, which was 19, and then he gets to hug his kids in the same spot where he hugged his parents when he won the first one. It's pretty, it's pretty symbolic in an obvious way, right? Like the, you, you were, you were a child, young man. Now you're a grown man with kids of your own. Like that's a wrap. You, you're probably not doing that again. Almost certainly not doing that again. Um, but I, I think he's probably cool with it. If you asked him right now, is he cool with it? He'd say, no, I'm going to play. I want to win. I, yeah. I get it, but honest with yourself, you good with it? How could you not be? It's got to be tough for a golfer because, like, when I watch football on TV, I'm like, hey, any bit of competitive juice that I have watching, my brain tells me you ain't ready to step out there. It's a totally different ball game. And if you're a golfer that's been great at what you do, 
as time passes, you might not be competing at the highest level, but that like invisible wall between you and competition probably feels smaller to those guys. No doubt. You know, because you can because just walk there's... out there and play. You're, you're still playing, presumably. Of course, because I don't have to, you know, you don't have to line up against Joe Thomas and try to beat him to the quarterback. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's no exactly. there's no physical exchange here. Like I, yeah. I I'm going to peg it up and shoot my score and you have nothing to do with what I what, what I shoot. It's just am I physically able to do it? And, yeah. and that's the I think that's the mind fuck for everybody is that the answer to that question. Um, and only truly only Tiger Woods would know. Just what he's phys- what physically he goes through just to to compete just to be yeah. able to walk. And I mean, this is where people eye roll that don't play golf and like whether they're an athlete, this or that. When you play golf, you ride a cart, because I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you walk this joint like a day, I'm telling yeah. you, you're feeling it tomorrow. And you do it for four days or four or five days, like like because you're doing practice rounds leading up to it. It's. I'm not suggesting it's like an NFL game. Clearly it no, isn't. But, but there's, still, there's still enough fitness that's required just to get from A to B that if you can't do the simple walking part, then you certainly can't do the hard part, which is the hitting the golf ball. Yeah. Scott, when you assess your career, do you owe anything to Tiger Woods? And by that, I'm referring to you, Tiger, Doral, Golf Channel. 100%. 100%. I've, I've said this, and it's I mean it. Like, what you're talking about is after he won in 97, I drove down to Doral to, to – to, ask him if he would do an interview with me. And I, I knew him well enough. It's a different time. It wasn't like you text the dude. So I got in my car and drove from Orlando to Miami um, and sat and waited in the locker room and asked him if we could do this thing the week of Bay Hill. He's like, I got, I, I, I told this story. Like literally, he's like, what, what are you doing here? I was like, I came here to ask you if you do this thing. He's like, right. Okay. No, really. Why are you here? I said, to ask you if you would do this interview. And then he did it. And we were supposed to get five minutes and we went for 45 and he was unbelievable. And it was like, I got the first crack at that. Like no one had sat down and talked to him about what he did. And we started on Thursday and went all the way to Sunday. And it was, he's incredible in that because he's truly taking you in the mind of this 21 year old kid that laid waste to every record here. And ESPN didn't get what I got because I got it first and kind of he was out of gas by the time they were like next up. And it put me on the radar. And my relationship with Tiger clearly was what ESPN was tr- hiring me for. It wasn't because I was I, – I, that was it. I had I had a relationship with Tiger that was different than than other, uh, other people in the media had at the time. And so I every now and then I go down this wormhole, and I'm not even kidding, where I think – if he if he didn't do what he did in ninety seven, if, if 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 I didn't get that interview with him in ninety eight, I li- my entire life's different. You know, I met my wife because I work at ESPN. I have the children I have because of these things. Like you can get to a place where I'm like I I picture myself like penniless and laying on the mm-hmm. ground outside like a high alive parlor or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah, where's broke Scott Van Pelt living? Ah, uh, bro, I would I need a high thread count sheet. I need I need. His, <laughs> I needed certain things in life that that it's gotten soft. <laughs> broke boy, broke boy, Van Pelt would really not be. Not, he would struggle. <laughs> I would. I look. I, I I figured it out. I faked it for a long time, but uh, I'm I'm grateful that Tiger Woods uh, and I met at the time we met, and that we had the professional. I don't know. I'm always uncomfortable calling it friendship, but I mean, uh, it's, it seems it's like a, a friendship. Yeah. I mean, in the way you get to know people, and then now at this stage of our lives, we know each other as, as you know, older dudes that are dads, and it's a very different existence, you know? And, yeah. uh, you know, being able to express that gratitude I have to him for, but I, all it was, Chris, and I'd say it's the same as it was with you. Like, I think I just treated him, this is the line my dad had, I've said it a million times, you treat normal people like superstars, you treat superstars like normal people. Yep. I think the reason I've always gotten along with people in the in the your arena is because you just... It's just you're not kissing their ass. You just try to be a decent person, show them respect, and get it back, and then yeah. act act just act right. It's not that complicated. Yeah. 
I want to talk about some hoops. Where should we start? We got we got uh, Cal. We got let's start with the women's basketball first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like the phenomenon that kind of shot the ratings through the roof in just a year, you know, basically doubling viewership. That to me is not just explained away by Caitlin Clark. You know, I, so what is the, you know, I'm not saying it's a phenomenon where we should be like, hey, why is this happening? We know it should be happening, but it right. took a while. Uh -huh. Why are we here, you think? Caitlin is clearly uh, the, she's the Tiger Woods tide here. Okay. She's yeah. the tide, I believe. But there are a lot of things that come along with it. There's the fact that last year they beat South Carolina, who was undefeated. Yeah. There's the fact that then LSU beat them. There's the John Cena thing, right. which turned right. into a whole other thing. Yep. Th there's the a Angel Reese becomes a, a a star, and then she got cast, I think, unfairly as a villain. I um, agree. Yeah. There's the whole Mulkey LSU storyline, and there's a ah. lot that there's a lot there. He loves Kim. Gorgeous woman. Okay. <laughs> and. All of these back in, things back in your back in your cage. <laughs> there's there's the there's the Juju Watkins thing. So you got a West Coast team, you got an LA based superstar. Um and the sport benefits from I haven't mentioned UConn yet. They lost like five players. They had the player Paige Beckers, who when she came out was the person that was gonna be the best player. Right. But it's but it's Caitlin who brings eyeballs that are just different. Look. The nights when other games got a big number, they got double the number. So yeah. it's pretty clear what she was. And the, the the absolute grace of Dawn Staley saying what she said about her afterwards. Yeah. Dawn's so awesome. Yeah. UVA in the building. Wow. Uh, yeah. Love her. Yeah. She's, uh, everything about her. Um, and her team's an incredible story. They had to replace the entire starting five. And, and yes. she was like going to quit, she said last summer, because they were a disaster. And then she explained to me, like, just organically, they all came together. But all these other storylines get the eyeballs and the attention, which is fantastic for the sport because of, because of you know, this Caitlin Clark and what, you know, it's some, it's, it's like a Hoosiers kind of a thing, right? It's a, it's a girl <laughs> in a ponytail that shoots 30 footers. Yeah. That, that that breaks records and then it becomes well let's hey who's Lynette Woodard oh she actually was awesome and she played for Kansas and she won an Olympic gold medal let's learn about her so right. so what was what was cool to me about this is the way other stories became either known or remembered and then and see this this happened the other night on the show where like Diana Taurasi like kind of came at her. I was like, like what's, what's going to happen? And she's like, oh, reality's coming and you're, you go great playing against 18 year olds and this, that, and the other. And I start laughing and clapping because every one of you, every one of you pro athletes in every sport, men's and women's any lane, when there's somebody coming, you all do the same thing. You put a bullseye on them and you're like, you better like, come get some young mm -hmm. fella, young lady. Mm -hmm. And only the great ones get the bullseye that you want to try to make an example of, that you want to try to go after just to show, you know, teach them a little something. And so I totally got what Diana Taurasi was doing. It turns into people saying it's jealousy. Like Diana Taurasi's jealous of what? Like, look at her trophy case and her accolades. Like she's, she was a superstar long before Caitlin Clark burst on the scene. I got what she was saying. It definitely came across to a lot of people as being salty. But I think that's what pro athletes do when the next superstar is coming. And to me, it's a compliment. Um, I get why people looked at it totally not as that. Uh, but I feel like a lot of it, it's complicated, too, because it's along racial lines. And then there's yep. you feel like people go after because she's the white girl. And it's yeah, dude, and it was crazy. The LSU thing. And for most fans, I think that are sensible people. Like, right. Normal human beings. They're like, this is awesome. I hope I believe at the core of it all is is respect. And that's what competitors tend to do is they go out one another. That's why what Dawn Staley did at the end of a 38 no season. She's thanking Caitlin Clark for, for, for doing what she did. And so to me, obviously if you're Iowa, you wanted to win the title and you came awfully close. You just didn't have the depth or the size of South Carolina. And so at the end of it, it's not the, it's not the, the storybook ending that you looked for, but I said this the other night in the show, like 
I'm, these are teams that both like it's a season in this in this sport that'll forever be remembered. Yeah. Now the that, now the question is, do the people that casually came to the to the table to consume this, will they stick around next year for Paige Beckers who's coming back and Juju who's at USC and all the all the there's, these storylines don't go away. You hope they do because I think that you know that people that watched it and consumed it if they if they were just casuals they're like oh wow these these they're really good I'm like yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah, it's they really are. fucking so, entertaining. And that's it, it. Face value for me. It's another great yeah. game on TV. Yeah. You know, like that that game the other day, the pace in that first half, I'm like, dude, I, this is way better than Purdue or whoever they just blew out. Like, well, the, rather... the Purdue-NC State game compared to like the first half of South Carolina-Iowa, like it's not yeah. close. Not yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, Bama, just... Bama-UConn was pretty entertaining. but Bama-UConn uh, was great. Um, pretty okay. okay, on the men's side with Coach Cal mm-hmm. taking the job at Arkansas, is this – are you ever surprised that this has run its course at like a Kentucky for him? No. Why why are you not surprised by that? Because there there were these weird there were these two uh two storylines that 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 were simultaneous and they were incongruent in, in this way. Cal has this insane roster of people that have come to Kentucky and gone to the league. La Familia, and he talks about generational wealth, and undeniably, that has happened. Young men have gone to Kentucky. They've gotten to the league. Would they have gotten to the league if they went to Oakland? Probably the guys that went to Kentucky. Like, like did he get them to the league, or did they play at Kentucky before they went to the league? A little bit of both, but my point is that they attracted great players, yes. and Cal was a big reason why. So on the one hand, you get to have this incredible mural on the wall. Every school does this, right? At Virginia, you're like, your guy's in the league, and you're like, this guy's in the league. DeAndre Hunter's in the league. This guy, this guy, this guy. Awesome. Well, Kentucky's wall is like a mural a mile long. Cool. Those guys weren't winning NCAA tournament games. And so Kentucky fans are saying, I'm psyched you keep getting good players, but I want to see you win games in the tournament, and you're not. Right. And at some point – these things need to intersect. We, we need these really good players to win games in March or, or like we're Kentucky. What are we doing here? And I, I think it, it felt like this kind of loveless marriage in the sense that like people like there's a, I'm sure there's animosity from Cal. Cause I'm sure he looks at, the, at them and goes, bring the next guy in, see how it goes. Yeah. And I think Kentucky fans are like, yeah, good luck. Cause we'll go do that. And now yeah. if you're Arkansas, you're like this is a coup. You've got this Tyson guy that's uh, the chicken you know, man, dude. The, the chicken, chicken man. Hey, look, big, the chicken man with pocket. a lot of chicken. <laughs> yeah, five dude. million, five million for nil. Supposedly, He's got a flock. something like that. I mean, <laughs> you a flock of wings, man. Uh, hell yeah! And but but here's the tricky part. Leaves Arkansas chicken. has had more Leaves. success in the in the NCAA tournament the last five years in Kentucky. Yeah. So it's like you go there and flame out in the first round. Well, now they're not happy either. So am I surprised? No. Like when he went there, it, it was – Cal in Kentucky was like that's as big a deal as you can have. Yeah. Um, big name, uh, an absolute blue blood. But at some point, you got to win tournaments. got to win uh, – excuse me, games in the tournament. They weren't. Seemed like they were looking for an out. And, and I've heard people – like who's next? Well, maybe Oates. Well, his his buyout's $18 million. They were ready to pay double that to get Cal to walk. So yeah. I don't know if Oates is the guy, but, yeah. um, you know, it doesn't it, – sometimes it could just it's, – it's rare. Like every, when, whenever somebody talks about a mutual breakup, you're like, nah, somebody broke up with somebody. This feels like the kind of situation where maybe from Cal and Kentucky's perspective, it's the rarest of things where both sides benefit from doing something different. If Golke is the one that sets this crazy, uh, you know, like uh, if, if Arkansas is great. I mean, that dude did something. He knocked Cal – butterfly effect yeah the butterfly effect the other thing is you talk about college basketball right now the one thing i want to bring up was Bronny. Bronny seems to me to be a great kid great mm-hmm. head on his shoulders obviously his dad's really sharp uh and knows the biz if you're lebron for a second here what are you counseling him as far as doing i i feel for him in this way, like Michael Jordan's kids played, yeah. And he, Michael Jordan's son played at UCF and was a good player, yeah. Um, but when you're Jordan's son, like, can you just be a good player? 
it seemed to me, and I, I understand that the young man had a heart issue that he came back from. Um, and, but, but it seemed in watching that he's obviously a good player. He's a division one scholarship player, but he's not an NBA player. Now he, he, he's, he's a college player. Yeah. I'd go play in college someplace. Um, and you know, the things that happen with LeBron tweeting out, like, can we just let the kid be a kid? And like, well, yeah, but you're the one that tweeted out that you're watching league pass and they brought these better than people in the league, man. Like right. <laughs> you, you kind of set the trap for him. Like, and, and that, the fact that he's a proud Papa, that's normal. It's, and it's awesome. It's great. Yeah. Like I, I applaud any dad that's yeah. that waves the flag for their kid, yeah. of course. But I can do it in a way that nobody cares if my kid's okay but not awesome. Mm -hmm. LeBron's kid and his name LeBron. And and I, I talked to somebody about this about you. Like I, I have so much respect for somebody whose dad was a Hall of Famer is going to try to do the same thing. You know, you would know how hard that is. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I feel for the kid. So I would ask you, I'm not trying to flip the script and be the yeah. interviewer, but as a guy that did it, like what what's what lane makes sense to give him to give a ch him a chance to become whatever it is he's – whatever his ceiling is, like how does he reach that? Tony Bennett. <laughs> Love it. I, no, I mean, honestly, I'm with you, like – He's living an incredible life. I mean, we were talking about earlier, like imagine being in high school and being Bronny James with all the trappings of it and all sure. the pressure and everything, but also really cool. Uh, and now the run he's on, there's going to be a lot of people waiting to see what he does next. I would say, like, maximize this time in your life. Go play college ball. It would be a lot more complicated back in our day. But like today, you're going to make a ton of money wherever you go. Like, you know, run it back another year and, and then figure it out. I mean, I, there, there's the whole conversation about LeBron wanting to play with him in the NBA. That's um, the tricky part. That's, that's the, the tricky, tricky part, part, right? Yeah. You know, because like if, if LeBron's like, hey, I'm, I want to get out of here, man, like, hurry up. <laughs> you know, because yeah, I kind of get that idea right now. I remember like Griffey Sr. and Griffey Jr. and, and, and a baseball is a game where I don't easy for me to sit here and say, oh, it's easier to play into your 40s. But I mean, I just we've never seen anyone at this age, at this level in the NBA. I mean, LeBron, we talked earlier about Tiger and like that. What that dude did at his peak is he made you numb to what he was doing. You just yes. just accepted that that's what he did because he was Tiger. And you're like, OK, cool. But you understand that's totally this is a one off. LeBron's the same thing. Yes. I kid I kid around with a buddy of mine in DC about Jordan. Like by the time Jordan played for the Wizards at this age, he he like played in a flop hat slides and had a beer belly. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he he wasn't a forty. He wasn't explosive at the rim. He wasn't still yeah. an absolute you know killer on the court. But at some point, like yeah, there's only so much gas in the tank. So yeah, I, I, the whole thing's tricky. I I, I would imagine I, that father and son have sat down and talked about. Hey, look, this is what I'd love to do. But like, what do you want to do? Right. I mean, at some point, a young man has agency over his own hopes and dreams. And, you know, I, I have to believe it'd be pretty cool to play with your pop. You know, but, I also think he seems like a really and I mean this a willing participant. He's not being coerced into making whatever decision like LeBron is mm -hmm. got a big voice. That's how their relationship is. He seems like he's well adjusted to it. You know, I just hope I, he is because I know it's a lot of pressure. Well, and that's the thing, man, that this is this is the part on the young man that's so difficult is that if you come out and you get drafted, well, you only got drafted because of one oh, thing. Yeah. It's not based gonna, on yeah. not based on the yeah. merits of, of the accomplishment this year. And so that puts that puts him in an incredibly tricky spot. Like I talked earlier about like Tarasi and, and a bullseye, bullseye on Caitlin. Well, like yeah. imagine the bullseye on Bronny James' son. Oh, hey, listen, I was just Howie Long's kid. I yeah. felt that shit. I mean, it's real. And I get it. Like, you, you got to prove it, man. Like, there's a perception that, in part at least, you're here because of your dad. Even though, you know, you, you do the things you do on the field, and that should be independent of that, that, that context. But people don't take it that way, and I feel for, for Bronny. That's all. Yeah. Scott, what say you of the current college sports landscape generally? No bigger Terp fan than you. It True. feels like you're not allowed to say – maybe we're not crazy about player empowerment and free markets and transfer portal, the elite eight, the, the majority of the starting fives didn't begin their careers at the current school. Yeah. I mean, it felt okay to cut a check when you're funding a scholarship, but feels, a, feels 
weirder when you're asked to cut a check to keep a guy around for another few months. It's fantastic that, that players get money. They should. The issue is that there currently is unregulated free agency in college sports. And that, does, that doesn't exist in professional athletics. There's a reason why everybody gets fired up in mid-March when it's NFL free agency. And in Saquon Barkley hits the market, it's because you had to wait all these years for him to get yeah. there. Currently, you and, – and these are professionals that, that have a, 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 a union – and if people look it out for their interests and, you know, they're not 18, 19 years old. Uh, in some cases, they're not much older than that. But you can't continue to have a situation where I'm, okay, I go to Virginia and I come get, the, they give me 250. Awesome. I outperform. And now next year, I'm on the portal. And then I go to uh, Arkansas and then I play okay. And then, I outperform or I don't outperform. And then I go to Florida State. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I, and the pro, I've, there was, I, I talked about it once in relation to the comments that Saban had. And every coach tells me the exact same thing that all anyone wants to know is how much money. And if you say that that's not great, then people push back and go, oh, you don't like young people getting money. That bull, Where did I fucking say that? I, uh, it, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying, I'd like, can you explain to me that you think it makes sense that uh, the only athletes in all of sports that are allowed every single year to leave, to go to the next highest bidder, are college athletes. I don't get it went from you couldn't have anything to now you can have anything. Yeah. Some sort of guardrail of some kind has to happen because every person you talk to says this will this can't be sustainable because boosters are funding it. The universities are not. So you go to Chris Long and say, see Long, we got a guy who's a difference maker. Uh, but we need half a million. And you're like, all right. Well, say you give it to him. Well, that's this year. And then next year, you come They're back, and like, back for another half mil. <laughs> hey, or he no, 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 because this year, this year, it's 700, yeah. 700 this year. Yeah. Oh, that's the part, too. And and at some point, even the richest boosters say, ask the next guy. Right. Um, and, and so uh, it's it's just. It's a tricky spot because everyone understands that something has to happen. No one, in, no one seems to know who the person or people are that are going to create the boundaries to try to keep to try to make it more sustainable. Is it they can't be employees? Can you have contracts? Do you limit the number of times you can transfer? Because currently you can just ping pong year to year. Yep. And oh, but coaches leave every year. You're right. And John yeah. Calipari just left. But there's like 1,500 people in the portal right now in basketball, and there's there there aren't 15 coaches that that, that leave. So th that's not the jammed. Yeah, it's not the same thing. And the yeah. minute that a coach leaves, then you ought to be able to leave because he he was your coach. Um, so I'm all for the players making money. Absolutely, they should. I'm not for the only athletes in all of sports that have unlimited, unregulated free agency being college athletes because that doesn't make any sense to me the guy who figures this out good luck going to be a is going to be a saint because everybody would love for two things to happen one us enjoy college sports two the players are compensated fairly uh for their contribution every time we turn on the tv anytime we watch something all the money rolling in i'm like you scott i want it to happen uh for the players but there has to be some you know some sort of way some yeah. some rule of some kind that isn't just you can you can leave every single year yeah. and go get more money next year and you know this like like a guy like tory smith like uh, my he he was he's to me he's the shining example of the way you athletes get used by the system but, mm -hmm. but athletes can use the system for education if they want tory got two degrees he also got two super bowl rings like that's the perfect situation 
He's the rare guy. You're a rare guy. People that make it and make their money and have accolades and win at the highest level, but also left college with multiple degrees so that when you stop playing, you're situated in a way where you're not. If you do get this money and you run through it, well, he's got something else. Yeah. I, I And I mean, this is where people like roll their eyes at you, but like the dude that goes or the girl that goes to four schools in five years, like are we, are, tra- are credits transferred or are we just. How do we quantify what. I have absolutely no idea. Well. It seems like none of it matters. So get the dough by all means, everyone. And they should get more of it and they should hey. participate in the TV part of it too. But that's tricky because it funds everything else. Um, but somebody, I don't know. I don't know who's going to get in charge of it because no one's in charge. There's no well, rules and there's no one to enforce the rules that don't exist. It's the wild west. And that's the way I hear it mostly get. Uh, uh, that's so, the analogy. Uh, that's, that's the analogy. Why, every time. Why I want to leave you with this. Cause I know you got stuff to do, but um, the, uh, the, the exercise that I sent out to you 15 minutes before the show, both of you, I like to, both of you to be on your toes. Uh, okay. I want you to form a broadcasting booth uh-huh. uh, in football and basketball. You can go college or pro, whatever it is. And I want you to take one coach who's currently a coach. I want you to take one player who's currently a player and one podcaster. And you're going to put them in this super booth. Who is going to be in your booth? You want to start with basketball? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've got Bruce Pearl. Mm. Okay. Ryan Rosillo. Okay. Yep. And Draymond Green. Ooh. Ooh. I, <laughs> the reactions. I, uh mute button yeah but didn't you see draymond did that commercial where he's like you know and sometimes you gotta that stop doing good. what you're doing yeah it's all in the past all right yeah i see your booth uh-huh i raise you greg popovich al shingoon who still needs a translator but <laughs> his english is getting better you know what i didn't get about shohei and his presser was that the translator was writing down as shohei was reading his statement like, right. why don't you just give the translator the statement and he can just read it? He Dude, was like, take a note. You, you lost me with that. Can I pause this for just a quick second? What do we think happened there? Oh, I think Shohei's gambling because, because, and here's the biggest one to me. If you're the translator, you got the balls to steal from your good friend and employer, but you don't have the balls to bet baseball. That tells me whoever was placing those bets had something to lose where they're like, that's a bridge too far. And for a guy to defraud his friend and to say, hey, I didn't want to bet baseball because that would be fucking my employer over. Who the fuck is your employer, buddy? It's not the MLB. It's Shohei Otani. So I think it's Otani. I just, we had one story and then we had another story. Like, he paid it off. No, it was theft. I mean, and this is, this, I said this on SportsCenter, and it, I, I, the, 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 there's a cultural difference, right? Well, you say there's a cultural difference. And I appreciate the, 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 the culture of Japan is different, but the culture here is where you play, and it sort of demands the, 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 the privacy that might be afforded you someplace else. Like, it's just not going to work, yeah. particularly when it comes to this particular thing. And then there's the language barrier where we're never going to hear him say anything. And so it's just an incredibly... I don't, know, I don't know. Like most things in life, most problems in life, it feels like people just wait. There's like a formula too early to, to talk too early to talk about it. Then we wait. And then after we've waited a long enough period of time, well, then that's in the past and we're moving forward. You're right. And it's this, it's a trick where you can create this vacuum where you don't ever have to discuss it because it's too soon. Then it's already in the past. And then we just play baseball. We do it with dead guys all the time. You know, like guy dies and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. He's kind of an asshole. And everybody's like, not right now. And then a year or two later, I'm like, hey, can I, can I circle back to <laughs> yeah. that guy and what uh-huh. he did in the 70s? I mean, just can we talk about it? It's like, oh, you're fucking living in the past. Cancel culture. Oh, fucking cancel culture. It's not real. Uh, all right. And my, my podcaster will be Stanford Steve because we all love Stanford Steve. Yeah. Fuck uh, universally shit. loved. Uh, up. Uh, Steve, with the with Steve's game day picks this year, was there a certain point where you stopped talking to him about them because it became nope. uncomfortable for us? As his we didn't bring friends. it up, I didn't bring it up. Somebody here it, might have brought it up once. Here, once. here's the thing about that. All right, I remember years ago going to uh, work one Sunday at ESPN, and there was these, there was this room where there's these massive monitors everywhere. And it was, it was Boomer, it was TJ, 
it was the late great Chris Mortensen. Uh, it's all the people that are working on like prime time and boomers watching a game and boomers. It doesn't make any difference because I don't remember who it was, but something happened and boomers like, Die! and he's uh, <laughs> Oh God! I'm like Scott. What is it? He's like, yeah, I, I schwad uh, the Bills. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Boomer. I'm like, who gives a fuck? You're Chris yeah. Berman. He's like, yeah, Scotty. You just, you, just, uh, you want to? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, t- I totally just blew it off. Like, who? Ca- you're Chris Berman, and you picked the wrong team. It doesn't make any difference. But it matters. And now, as a guy that has a show, and you pick a, have a segment called Winners, I don't grip harder for anything than the games I pick because I want to be right. Because why? Because when you lose, some bozo on Twitter is going to heckle you and tell you you suck. All of this is a backstory to say our guy Stanford Steve, who was great, his game picks last year were awesome. And then he goes on the single biggest college football show there is, and he's slapping his picks on the side of a fridge, and his picks are absolute uh, rubbish. And so uncomfortable, no, just it's the agony of it I can relate to. Um, and he'll do better next year because you can't do worse. No, it's right. the biggest stepping out on the ledge thing. It's more personal than like doing a monologue in the open. It's like giving your football take, and for the reason you mention it, they do not fucking let you live it down. You would think they were all 65% gamblers. And and everyone on Twitter claims to be. That's the that and and uh, when, when we there. when um when we had Walters on uh the gambler yeah. um about his book. Yeah. And I, I I and I was interested in the stories, but I just I wanted him to come on to say on the record. I'm like, "What's Billy, what's a great year gambling? What give me a percentage?" Like, "Yeah, oh, you know, 57, 58%." I, I'm like, "Thank you." Yeah, because like I got like two years in a row about sixty percent picking games on on uh, high fifties. I'm not gonna lie and say sixty. Yeah, and Rasilla loves to laugh at me because when we used to pick this, I would always say, "You go sixty percent in Vegas, they'll build a statue of you," yeah. because it's hard. But that doesn't matter because people on Twitter are gonna say you suck. Steve did not hit that threshold. Was not no, in didn't. the fifties. No. Not didn't didn't start no, with a five. No. Um, my booth. Did someone already take Rasillo? Uh, yeah, I took Rasillo. Sorry about that. Not, well, I mean, when we, we broke up, you pretty much went with him yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I stole him. I said, that's, yeah, that's I'll, fine. Take, I'll take stepdad. It's, <laughs> it's fine. Um, I'm going to go co- – the coach is going to be Kerr. He's done it. He's good at it. Yeah, he would be good. Uh, the player is C.J. McCollum. He is mm, uh, a, yeah. super, a super smart dude Yeah, who's good. At, he's professional at everything he does. Now, if, the, if uh, this is so cheating, like is Re- uh, Reddick's a podcaster, isn't he? Yeah, you can take him. Kerr, McCollum, Reddick. Okay, cool. Very professional. Football, I got Jason Kelsey. Yeah. We, we'd like that, that too. Yeah, I know. We, I, we, <laughs> we'd love to have that too, Jason, if you're listening. We, I got Mahomes, Kelsey, and Bill Belichick. Raspy uh, Romo. Could you imagine Mahomes in there? Regular dude with a voice. Sounds like you just smoked a pack of Winston. Yeah, hey, I, I started. I, I'm going to just stick with Berman. Yeah, I don't, you're I don't, crushing the Berman thing. Uh, but but do you do you understand the Kelsey thing, the phenomenon? Obviously, yes. we've talked about this. Like, it's does anybody else remind you of that? The way he's taken the country by storm. No, but think about it. It's like a, it's a it's a combination of all the things. Number one, you were there that day. Maybe blurry. You were wearing a mink coat. I think <laughs> I was like, uh, I was uh, when him he do was that, I was like, please don't. When he was in the Mummers outfit. Yeah. Uh, at the parade. Yeah. Um, like people knew him and they liked him, but then he and his brother start this pod and it's really good. And then he starts dating a singer who's fairly well known. Yes. And the whole thing takes on this different deal. But then I think what people, they, they learn about his family and the daughters and that he's this guy. And I asked you and you talked about it on, on, uh, inside the NFL. Like I reached out just to say, like, is this a guy, is he who I think he is? And you're like, yeah. Like it's crazy. You waited, for him, you waited for him to reveal himself, and you realize he he was he's just just this authentic great guy. Yeah. So I think that the, I think wh- whoever gets him is going to be able to tap into that this authentic, likable guy who, by the way, is a Hall of Famer and played an incredibly important position. So he's going to help you understand it as well. But you just he's just so likable. Like very few people feel that likable to me. Charles Barkley's one. Yeah. You know, that has that, that, that Stanford, gravitas Stanford where Stanford mm-hmm. is another. But I think, I think Kelsey's got that same thing. 
All right, so who's rounding out y'all's booths? Just stick the landing. You guys got to go to the butler's cabin. Play Butler cabin. It's butler cabin. <laughs> okay. Singular. There's, there's no possessive. You should take a look at it, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Very nondescript little single-family home. Yep. You're asking me about the commode in there, for God's sake. He's just got to round out his booth. Deion yep. Sanders, DeAndre Swift, and podcaster <laughs> Kyle Long. Okay, good, good. Scott's going to begrudgingly throw three names out. We're going to let him go. <laughs> no, Say the I, thing. Because here's – okay, McVeigh's awesome. Yes. Because he's he's – Got the good looking thing. He's got the kind of, he's got that thing going. But then he's got photographic recall of everything that's ever happened in every moment, it's which perfect. is preposterous. Bolichek, by the way, would be incredible. I think so um, too. That's what people don't get is that there's a different version of him. And when he was on the, like the top 100 on NFL Network with yeah. Eisen doing breaking down stuff, like when he's engaged and, and into it, as opposed to talking to us, which he'd rather be stuck in the eye with a fork. Like, he's unreal. <laughs> but McVay would be great. The player, um, I want a defensive guy. I want a defensive guy. Like, what Micah about like Parsons. a – Parsons. Uh, I want a lot I, to say. He I does. Like yeah. But what about somebody – what about like an OG, like a like – a, uh, like a Wagner, like is is Bobby Wagner talk enough? He's super put together. He's like type A to a T. He's just got his life on lock, you know. Well dressed, smells good, fucking makes every How tackle. Good? He smelled How good? great. I don't even remember what it, what he smelled like, but I know he smelled good. And he he would be great on TV. Bobby Wagner I, would be good. But and and you don't care. You're just trying to get rid of me at this point. But I no no I, no. I, I there's you know there's the actually, tension I'm when putting, your buddies at the Masters. And yeah, but I'm putting sitting in a room with a fucking picture of the with masters. A picture of the masters. <laughs> you should be in, you should be enjoying that picture. I should, but but wait, that I don't know if I don't know if it's Wagner or I, you know what? No, it's not. Bobby just got cut. It's um, it's Fred Warner. Fred Warner, I love Fred him. Warner. He's awesome. great guest. I don't Was know he how good? he smells. No, he doesn't smell as good as Bobby Wagner. Oh uh, like well, we wrong. may have to podcaster Seawall Greenlight. What's up? There we go. Did you just go to ESPN.com and sort defensive players by tackles? I did. I did. <laughs> okay. oh, that's I, incredible. I, I went. I went to. I went to defensive players, and I'm like, I want a defensive player. I want I a want, defensive player who doesn't. And I want someone defense. who I've talked to that I'm like, this guy would be. In, I, I, I'm putting work into the homework. Oh well, you're leaving Alex Singleton out or Zaire Franklin for God's sakes. He has a fucking podcast. <laughs> well, but. Aziz well, Al-Shair, he made a lot of tackles. Like I, got a guy smells, I got a guy who smells good and dresses well. <laughs> he dresses really Our well. Our booth is strong. Quincy Williams is a wildly entertaining cat, by the way. Okay. That's all I'll say. Okay. Right. Um, Mike, and ask, him, ask about what happened when we were in Vegas. I can't <laughs> wait. Yeah, it's going to be a great it's, time. It won't be as funny in translation, but I promise you at no, 3.30 in the morning Vegas time, I promise you – that you've never seen two adult people laugh to the point that they wept. Shout out to we... Billy Lucci. Um, and, he was there, uh, and 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 you know uh, he told some good Dan Campbell stories, um, and that's worth its weight in gold. Like having him out, he said that Dan Campbell used to stay at the Excalibur when he was in the league. He used to come into Vegas and stay at the Excalibur. Something I've been trying to trying to break. That's news I'm trying to break. Yeah, um, you talk about dip cups in the sink. No, yeah, Div Cups in the Sink, that too. Made Dan sound very relatable. What are you saying to me? Eating nerd rope? Or? No, 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 he likes the nerds. Oh, you like the nerds? The one, the cluster things. It's a, it's a, I'm team sweet tarts till I die, but these nerds, it's like a combination of the sweet. God damn, and, that's good, Scott. Did you that's have good. one? Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah, you, you've made a you made a horrible mistake. Go get you, you some, it. go get you some nerd clusters and watch some golf, man. We appreciate you, big dog. Uh, it's a pleasure. On. Hopefully you can chop this up and make something decent out of it. No, it'll be great. You know from being in the biz. Tight 10. Yep. Hey, hell yeah.